Now we have resources, circular economy. And we have our third speaker here. Dan is already ready. Uh, you can come on up here. Um, so this is already your slides. And I introduced Dan earlier. Maybe you remember he's speaking about PV, which you could guess by now already. It's on the slides. Dan is an entrepreneur, so his focus is also on how to reuse materials, but also on how to make this a viable business. So for both sides involved in the transaction, actually three sides, you have three sides in your transactions, you see also one of them. It's a very interesting concept, I invite you to join the session, because this is something I really believe could be done here, because you're already doing it in different places abroad. You started it obviously in Amsterdam, in the Netherlands, but you're active now abroad, and even in the Netherlands, it's not limited to Amsterdam. And what is this now? It has nothing to do with garden gnomes, or does it? Dan, uh, try to attach this, or? Yeah, let me try. How's that dessert? Is it good? Is that like the, the local prickly pear? Is that part of the... It's, it's on? Okay, it's on. Hello. Uh, thanks so much for having me. Um, I'd like to share a little bit of my journey today. Um, it, it starts quite a while ago, in, in 2009, when this happened. This, this happened. Um, my house burned down. I, uh, before this happened, I had a, had a wonderful uh, job. I had a, a lovely car. I owned a lot of stuff. I was very independent, and uh, I didn't need anything from anyone. Um, but when, yeah, after this, this happened, I had to learn uh, a new skill, because my not only did my house disappear, uh, my job ceased to exist. Uh, the car that came with that job was gone. Uh, the stress of, of dealing with the fire uh, had, a, had a bad effect on my relationship, so suddenly I was left with nothing. And, well, actually nothing looks more like this. And, and I had to develop a new skill. I had to learn how to ask for help. And um, what I found out is that my sort of, I, I had always felt like I needed to be super independent, but I learned that asking for help can actually be really nice. Because I, I discovered that a lot of people were actually willing to help me. They, in fact, they, they love to help me and love to, to, to share when I, uh, when I needed uh, their help. So I, I started to look at the world from this new perspective. Like, what would happen if, we, if somehow more of us were, uh, you know, were brave enough to be a little interdependent? Um, and I, I started looking at neighborhoods from that perspective. And I was thinking, what would happen if instead of having walls between all these houses, we would have little corridors and you could walk from one house to another. And I realized you would probably see so many identical or semi-identical homes like, with, the, with the same stuff, the same uh, camping gear, and the same lawnmowers, and the same tools, and the same barbecues. And the, it's, like, it's like all this stuff is replicated hundreds of times and I ask myself, does a, uh, uh, you know, a, a neighborhood with 100 houses, does it really need 100 lawnmowers? Or is there, is there a smarter way to do that? Because most of the stuff that we own, we, we, you know, sits idle most of the time. Um, I read in the LA Times that the average American owns 300,000 items. Is, it, is, is that, does that ring true for, for you guys here? Is that, does it sound right? <laughs> um, so mostly books. Oh, that's oh, that's a good that's a good thing to own. Also a good thing to share, by the way. Um, yeah. So most of our, our stuff sits idle. Take this power drill for example. The average power drill uh, is used for about three percent of its capacity. Um, so I thought, what what would happen if we were able to share that capacity? What if that that idle time that is just in a cupboard or in a shed if we can, can use that uh, to, to let more people enjoy that item. So I, 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 I worked in technology, I worked in software, so 
I decided I would want I wanted to use technology and software to try and create this kind of uh, behavior, to try, try and encourage people to, to do this. So that was the idea, uh, to, to enable people to basically ask for something they need, whether it's a power drill or a bigger suitcase, send that out in, uh, in a neighborhood, then um, if a neighbor says, yes, I've got that, you can, you can borrow it, we cannot connect them through a check, and then they agree to meet and uh, people pick it up. And that was the idea. And when I started pitching this uh, uh, years ago, uh, a lot of people told me you're crazy. Nobody wants to share. Nobody likes sharing. You know, you, you don't even don't even start. Uh, but there were also a few people that believed that you know if this worked, it would be good for communities. Um, one of those people was was Jared, um, who you might recognize. If I if I if I tell you he's he's uh, uh, the, the half of Ben and Jerry, mm -hmm. um, so he uh, uh, he actually put a gave us a little money to try and see if we could develop this idea uh, into something that would actually work, and it wasn't easy. Uh, it was very hard at first to be precise to to figure out how we could encourage people to do this, especially because we were trying to do it in a in a way that we could not just do it in one community, but that we could bring it. Uh, to everywhere through through an app, um, but after a few months, we figured out we we sort of we figured out our first sort of uh, 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 we, we had a first little success, and it was uh, 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 our first two people that actually shared something through the app. Um, but this is in Amsterdam. This is Ruben and this is Danielle. And Ruben is an artist, and he was working on a wooden sculpture, uh, but he didn't have a uh, a saw. And Danielle had to have a song. Um, and uh, not long after this sort of first thing happened, we were able to, to keep tweaking and working on how we could make the app better. And actually, more and more people started sharing uh, from planners to, uh, to tools to uh, clothing. And um, people also started to discover that there's so many things in their house that they've never thought about that you know, are items that you could share. So now we create this app that basically turns this power drill from, a, from a, an item that can only be used by one person into something that can be used by 32 people. And um, the reason I think that is, is important because uh, it's, it's, we, it's, it's what we're going to need in the future. Uh, we come from an, an, an economy that we've developed in the last uh, centuries where we take uh, things out of the, uh, out of the earth we use them and then uh, they go to waste. And over the next few decades, that 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 source is going to run dry. It's going to, you know, if you t if you keep taking, at one point there's nothing left to take. So we need to come up with a with a new system, with a new type of economy where we are still able to enjoy, you know, the the rich life that we have today, enjoy the resources that we have today. So we have to figure out how to create a circle instead of this. This this line where where in the end everything ends up on a <laughs> as a big pile of waste. So um, this is uh, yeah this is what I'm passionate about and um, I hope that in this way uh, we can help uh, uh, products to become uh, uh, to change products uh, uh, to, from from to, to become products that are no longer designed to become obsolescent to go to waste but to be products that are designed for uh, communities and that are, uh, are, are meant for shared use. Thank you. Sure, yeah. Actually, Please. this concept is out there, whether we realize it or not. Hospitals have these places where you go get a walker, a wheelchair, a bed, uh, uh, child's crib, they're out there, but they're buildings where you go. It's almost like a library. You go check out a video, you check out a book. It's out there, but it's not like online. You go to a building that loans these things. We, we've been in this position ourselves. We needed a saw. We needed a wheelbarrow, but we didn't know anybody here. And you know what? You drive at Home Depot, and it's really sad that we have to do that so far away where we can have a building here where people either donate it or share it and you go like check it out it, it's simple to do that it's wonderful it's wonderful thank you yeah and, and maybe very very
very soon you can really do this here because this ob obviously this works best in a closed circle in a small radius because otherwise you don't want to drive 200 miles to share a power drill, right? This doesn't make any sense. But in a closed circle in a neighborhood environment, that's where it makes the most sense. So if we have we have a couple other questions. Yes. Otherwise, we do the we do the discussion afterwards because that was that was uh, just use the posters. We can also hand out more posters, so you don't forget it. We don't want to lose anything, but we also don't want to lose Martin, who who kept uh, you know fully awake. You know, you know what time is it now in the Netherlands? I shouldn't ask. It's it's. I don't know. I, let's it's not focus on it. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's we keep this a secret, but it's not easy to be last, and uh, you have a great story to tell. So, yes, my batteries are running low, so that's a good reminder. Very very soon, I should replace these batteries. Um, Here's your microphone. I introduced Martin before, and you can see on the screen already, if you forgot in the meantime what it's about, it's about repair cutting. Martin, thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's really wonderful to be here in Superior today, and I'm thrilled and grateful to be able to uh, tell you something about Repair Cafe, um, a concept that I created 10 years ago and I've been busy spreading since. Um, my name is Martine Vosma, and I'm the founder of the Repair Cafe International Foundation. So this is a repair cafe. It's a free repair meeting organized by and for civilians on a voluntary basis. It's usually very much fun. You learn about repairing, you see that it's possible. You have a chat, you have a cup of coffee or tea, and at the end of the afternoon, in 70% of the cases, you go home with an object which is no longer broken, but can be used again for years. The Repair Café addresses a problem that uh, many people in the Western world will recognize, and this is that things break. And when they do, many people just don't know what to do anymore because they don't have repair skills, they don't have tools, and they don't have time to focus on the subject. So they're in trouble when something breaks. At the same time, in every community, there are still some people who do have those skills and who own tools, and who also have time. And usually these people have been repairing and fixing and tinkering for decades at home, helping their entire family and uh, teaching themselves. And they're so fond of doing this that these people are more than happy to help their neighbors. So that's the idea of Repair Café, that the volunteer repair experts from the neighborhood come to uh, a community center, like this wonderful place could be, uh, and um, they bring their tools, and then the neighborhood is invited to come there with broken items, and then the idea is that you sit at the table together with the expert, and you try to examine the object together, find out what's wrong, and ultimately to fix it so that you can use it again. I, um, I thought up this concept 10 years ago because I found it shocking that so many perfectly good items are thrown away every day, like these uh, two cute little folding beach chairs. This is a photo from my street in Amsterdam. Uh, I saw them standing there, and actually when I walked by, I couldn't see anything wrong with them, so I, I took them home secretly, and I examined them. And um, I found that one of them, there in one of them was one dowel missing, and that was all. So I glued a dowel back in there, and I took them to a thrift store where someone can buy them and use them to sit in the sun on a beautiful day. So um, I've got many more examples like this. This is a picture from my neighborhood too. And all this stuff 
was discarded as waste. Whereas in my opinion, at least the, the chair and the suitcase, they're not waste at all, they just need a fix. So I started thinking about this and wondering, why do people do this? Now the answer is, is simple, it's because our economy stimulates this kind of behavior. Because new stuff is around everywhere, you can buy it and it's not so expensive, you can have it brought to your house at any time. So um, this makes it more attractive in many cases to buy something new than to have the old item repaired. Now, economically, that's understandable, but it is not sustainable at all. For this causes us to throw away items way too soon and use way too much of our natural resources and also we use a lot of energy producing new stuff and in this production process a lot of CO2 is, is emitted which in turn causes climate change and we all agree that that is not good. So I thought this needs to change and I wanted to make repair attractive once more. At that time, 10 years ago, repair was not thought of in a very positive way by many people. Uh, many people thought that it's, it's difficult and you cannot find a repair guy and if you do find one, he's expensive and altogether repair is dirty and it creates noise and dust and, and it's boring. So people didn't feel so positive. However, my own idea, oh, sorry. My own idea is, is quite different. In my experience, repair is a very positive thing to do. And it's not so difficult, it's often easy, and it can be very much fun when you do it together with an expert who can tell you what, what, what needs to be done and how to solve the problem. And if this expert is a volunteer, a, a friend or a neighbor, then it can also be cheaper to repair an item than to, to replace it. So I started um, thinking about this and, and talking about this and that's how gradually the idea of Repair Café came up. So I wanted to bring back repair into our daily lives and um, I had uh, talks with many people and I decided to, to test the, the concept in practice once. So to combine the people with, with the repair skills with the people with the broken items and to put them together and see what, what, what would happen. So I rented a room 10 years ago um, in this um, building in Amsterdam, which was a theater at the time. And I uh, approached friends and craftsmen from the neighborhood. I collected tools and I wrote a press release inviting everyone to come together on the 18th of October 2009 for the very first repair cafe. And I had no idea if people were going to show up, but they did, and it became a very much uh, a success. And we had um, a seamstress that day, we had a carpenter, we had two bicycle repairers, we had five guys from a computer club. Uh, but all day, people were especially standing in line for this guy on the left, who was the only one repairing electric household appliances. And he, he had so much to do the entire day. He had no time to take a break all day. He kept on repairing. He repaired uh, lamps and toasters and video players and radios and Did he come back? kettles. Sorry? Did he come back? Uh, he never left. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, uh, so he, he, he was the hero of the day. And uh, every day of every, the, the, the entire afternoon, people were, were so happy to have a pressure for the item repair and so grateful for the help that they received. And altogether, the atmosphere was so positive that for me, it was immediately clear that I had to, to go on spreading this idea um, and to uh, to make it possible that every, everyone could go to a repair cafe or have their own repair cafe all the time. So that's what I decided to do then. I started the Repair Cafe Foundation and I wrote a manual 
um, telling you how to organize your own repair cafe. And it takes you step by step through the process of organization. Tells you how to find volunteers, how to select a venue, how to collect tools, etc., etc., how to provide a safe working environment. And this manual gradually developed into a, a complete starter kit containing <coughs> lots of additional documents as well, like posters to decorate the room and the registration form that people can fill out to indicate what they're bringing and um, uh, lots of other documents too. And this has, um, that was 10 years ago uh, at this moment. The, 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 the starter kit is available in, in seven languages and it can be ordered via our website repaircafe.org slash en. Uh, it's a digital kit, so you can download and print it and use it to set up your own local repair cafe. It's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> and this has so far resulted in almost 2,000 repair cafe locations in 35 countries around the world. Uh, most of them are in the Netherlands and neighboring countries, Belgium, Germany, France, the UK. But a growing number is here in the US, especially on the east and the west coast. And Unfortunately, not yet here in Arizona, but um, I have uh, high hopes that uh, you will be the, the first repair cafe in Arizona. Yeah, that baby. That would be great <laughs> and really wonderful. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure it will work here too, because it works everywhere. The ingredients are, are, are present everywhere. And there's, there's some pictures of repair cafes around the world. The, on the left is the repair cafe in Ghana. This is in Poland. Uh, the one below is in Palo Alto here in the US. And that's in Belgium. And this is a picture from the Netherlands. And um, what strikes me in these pictures is that a repair cafe looks more or less the same wherever you go. So in all these pictures, you see concentration, you see people making a joint effort, you see gratitude, you see fun. And this makes me very happy because when people like to do something, they probably want to continue doing so. And that is exactly what we like them to do. So every now and then, I try to measure the impact of Repair Café on the environment, and I use a calculation method based on um, the last years of, of experience. And um, uh, this is that every uh, uh, average repair cafe group organizes one meeting per month, at which approximately 25 repairs are carried out, of which 70% is successful. So with uh, 1930 uh, repair cafes around the world at this moment, that equates to 1930 repair meetings per month, at which 35,000 products are saved. And that's 35,000 products per month that do not become waste and do not end up in landfills or incinerators. So that's a good thing. And 50,000 people are reached with the message that repair is an option for them too every month. Now that's all very well and when I started the Repair Café I thought I was a little bit naive I thought this is the solution to the problem of waste you can repair stuff you don't have to throw it away and then there will be no more waste now unfortunately um, reality is a bit more complicated because many products today have not been designed to be repaired. They've been designed to be used for a couple of years and then to be thrown away and to be replaced by something else. You can repair them if you know what you're doing, but it's certainly not made easy. Like these guys, they're trying to remove a switch, but they're not succeeding. They don't have a manual which could tell them how the switch can be removed without breaking the product. 
And maybe they need a special tool to remove it, but they don't know about it, and they certainly don't have it. And if they break the switch, they're going to need a spare part, a replacement, but they don't have that either. So what I'm trying to say is um, repair is possible, but you're completely on your own. The manufacturer doesn't help you in many cases. He could if he wanted to, and we believe that he should. We believe that repair should be supported in every possible way. And that's why we've started to collect repair data. For if we want to convince manufacturers and politicians that something is lacking and that something needs to change, then we need data to prove it. So we've developed the, the repair monitor. It's an online system in which the repair cafe volunteers can enter data on the repairs that they carry out. So they can indicate what kind of things they repair, what's wrong with them, if the repair succeeded, etc. And we at the foundation, we can um, draw conclusions from these data, like what kind of things are brought to the repair cafe the most and what's wrong with them. Is there anything to say about common failures or reparability of specific brands? Uh, and this is the top 10 of products that have been entered into the, the monitor so far. Uh, there have been 20,000 repairs entered, registered into the repair monitor, and the, the great majority is from the Netherlands. And the top 10, our first uh, number one product is the coffee machine. This is the most popular product brought to repair cafe, followed by the bicycle, trousers, vacuum cleaners, lamps, sewing machines, clocks, irons, laptops, and coats. So that's the uh, top 10 so far. And we analyze this data, and already interesting trends begin to show, like uh, an example. This uh, type of coffee machine is the most popular product at, in Repair Café so far. It's uh, the Senseo coffee machine made by, the, by Philips, which is a Dutch manufacturer. So it's a very popular product in, in Holland. Many people have a Senseo machine. And um, the most common problem with this type of coffee machine turns out to be that the float stops working. And the float is a small part, is in the water tank, and it measures the water level. So it's supposed to, to move up and down uh, according to the water level. But it stops working when the magnet, which is inside it, uh, gets rusted. Now, unfortunately, that happens all the time because the float is mounted in water, but the magnet is not stainless. So it can be replaced, and that it's not so difficult to replace it, but our repairers argue that it would be even better to use a stainless magnet. And there are stainless magnets too, with a rubber or plastic coating. So that's a concrete piece of advice that we have now shared with Philips, and they're going to look into it and hopefully they're going to do something about it to improve this product and make it more repairable and more sustainable. And this way, the repair monitor data can serve as evidence in our plea for more repairable and more durable products that fit into the circular economy. Now, I hope this will inspire you to start a repair cafe here in Superior uh, and, to sh uh, to, and that it will show you that um, a more sustainable and more circular lifestyle is not something difficult or abstract or something far away, but it's something positive, it's easy, it's fun, and it can be adopted um, at any moment. You can start repairing today or tomorrow, and uh, uh, it's good fun. So. <coughs> Um, yeah, that's, it's, it's not only good for the environment, but also good for the community. Um, recently, there was an interview on BBC Radio with Chris Lee, who's organizer of the Royston Repair Café, that's in the UK, near London. And Chris said that repair cafés have a wider role to play than connecting broken idols with repairers. It's connecting people with each other. Repair 
interface slows you down a little bit and it creates a sense of togetherness. And we couldn't have said it more um, to the point because that's exactly what Repair Cafe does. And I would even like to go one step further. By slowing people down, the Repair Cafe also connects them with their common sense, with their inner feeling of what is right. For when you sit down together and you take the time to make a repair, you realize that it's actually a normal thing to do. And when you succeed, you feel good, you feel strong. And when communities are, are empowered in such a way, they are capable of achieving more together. And that's the kind of mindset and, and the thing that we need for a more sustainable future. So I would um, like to encourage you, start a repair cafe and make repairs and have fun. Thank you. And we'll share your microphone uh, so you can hear us. So, so yeah, there were a few questions earlier already for Dan. And yeah, you can you can be in the middle, uh, Martin. You can be in the middle. Uh, but anyway, we're we're listening to your questions. Yes. Two two thousand years ago, God came to Earth and set an example of a man who would give everything, even his life, for everybody else. On one day, 3,000 people decided to follow him and decided to give everything they owned, every penny of money, every food they had, everything they had in, our, in their time. Now, like, the superior needs a leader. Every one of you were leaders, and you have a lot of people now who are following because you were willing to volunteer first to be the leader. Now, we have a leader here, obviously. Somebody has spent the money to dedicate this building and be a leader. I'm willing to follow him. We moved here because we thought that our talents and skills could be used, but the town wasn't ready for music in the school and, and for a substitute teacher. And so we have, we're going to have to move. If we don't find some way to increase our income, we have to move. We can't live on Social Security alone today on the house. So... Uh, we, we're highly motivated, and I, I'm sure there are a lot of people in this town that are highly motivated, but they, they needed somebody to lead them. And, and you've given a great example, and if we will follow and step forward and be leaders, we will inspire followers. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's, it's really a phenomenal first step to have people come together here and to share ideas and to discuss the way forward. I think things aren't done overnight. You didn't start with 2,000 repair cafes. You started with one. It was kind of a bold step. You didn't know if people would come. You started with two employees or two colleagues, and uh, now you're almost 100. And that you had also to fight to get at least the first exchange happen over the app. So breaking the ice or this first success that's really tough and then of course there's more challenges afterwards too but first things first more questions yes um regards to the uh, fear box how do, you, how do you how do you do how do you handle damages and who covers the damages uh so we had um early on what we did was we left it uh, all to the community and we noticed that people are actually very trustworthy so if they break something They'll usually tell you about it, and they'll offer some way to, you know, repair it or to resolve it. Um, as we've grown, we've we've tried to come up with measures to sort of make that trust um, implicit within the system, so you know you can depend on on also on the platform to solve that. So we now have uh, like an insurance that uh, covers damages or or loss. Uh, so if anything goes wrong, it's it's covered. But it just doesn't mean that we have to switch from a, uh, a model that's completely free to a model where everybody pays a little bit when they borrow something. Uh, not necessarily to the person that's lending it, but uh, to, to ensure that if anything goes wrong, uh, the community covers it. Great. Thank you. One more? Yes. Um, for the, the RCs, um, how do you pay for the overhead? Well, um, the, the Repair Café 
pay is a volunteer activity, so there is no real payment involved, or not necessarily. People are invited to uh, make a donation uh, in the tip jar, uh, and the volunteers can use those donations to maybe buy a special tool that they need, or pay the rent for the room if they have rent, or um, also so like electricity, water. Yeah, like for example, but most repair cafes actually have a free space that they can use uh, because they also bring new people into the community center or they go to a library and have a place at the library that they can use. So for the local repair cafes, the costs are not so high. It's just, um, well, some, some rent maybe or some costs for, for coffee or sandwiches or for an occasional barbecue with the volunteers, so that kind of thing. Yeah. I have a, a question about the uh, comments. What I noticed in your presentation is that the repair cafe is more than, than the Sharon, but it's implied there too, is that it's multi-generational. I see a young person sitting in a room with someone who's mentoring, downloading what they know to, the, to another generation, and I think that's extraordinarily important. Yeah, I totally agree with you. It is important because, and especially in, in repair cafes, it's um, usually the older generation that has the skills and um, we should um, take care of, of passing on these skills and sharing them with younger people so that we can continue repairing in the future. That's absolutely vital. That's a great lead in. Thank you. And, and now we want to invite you to do a little bit of a um, team activity. So um, if you can identify a person sitting next to you, you can now use the next five minutes to discuss skills or knowledge that you might have to be to bring in to building um, to contributing to a circular economy here, be it in a repair cafe, uh, but it can also be other aspects. It can also be um, knowledge that goes beyond repairing something. It can also be, of course, your knowledge. I mean, we talked about the food. I talk about food all the time. So the edible, the desert edibles. Uh, it can be something, you talked about the schools, so education, teaching uh, aspects. So please go ahead. Um, if you are unsure who is your neighbor to work with, you can also do it in, with three people. It's not against the rules. Don't, don't be shy. Uh, we don't want anybody left alone. That's to be sure. And you have these uh, post-its if you want to write down some ideas. And then we give you just a few minutes five minutes to talk a little bit. Maybe if you don't know the other people, you'd say hi first. If you know them already, you can skip that. And <laughs> please go ahead, and then after five minutes, we'll collect some ideas and discuss further. Thank you.